And at 10, Barry Allen. Okay, I know you're probably confused with this one. Like, how is Barry Allen a child of himself? One of the Flashes and the original Silver Age Flash. Well, in the Crisis on Infinite Earths comic crossover event, Barry ends up running so fast that he ruptures the time barrier. This kills him, but also it converts his physical being into lightning. And since he was running so fast, he also travels through time, because you know, comics. In fact, he travels back to the day he got his powers, perhaps because he was thinking about how that one day led to all of this. However, when his physical form, now lightning, travels through time, he actually becomes the lightning bolt that struck himself. So Barry Allen gave Barry Allen his powers. So in a way of flashes creating other flashes, Barry Allen is the child of Barry Allen. Yeah, you heard me right. It was also later strongly implied that Barry's soul resides inside the speed force, the source of power for all speedsters. So technically, if you want to look at it like that as well, every speedster who uses the speed force is also a child of Barry. And at 9, Velocity. Velocity is a clone of Jay Garrett created by Brain and Monsieur Mala and sold to Ratu Benin, dictator of Mali. Velocity is unleashed upon the outsiders when they're discovered covered by Benin, and the speedster comes close to defeating the team while Metamorpho attacks him with acid and manages to overpower him. He's later taken by Green Lantern, who states that the Outsiders cannot be trusted. He also has all the powers of the Flash, except with one flaw, that he cannot survive outside of his suit for long. And I mean, it, it's certainly a badass suit, cause like, look at that thing. If I wore that thing, I'd never want to take it off. Add the fact that I can't take it off, I would die, and then there's no way that you're, that you're getting that thing off me. And Velocity, like Jay Garrick, doesn't need acid access to the speed force to run at superhuman speeds. Which is certainly beneficial if, say, the speed force were to die because the Spectre had to unlock its power during Crisis and then it threatened, you know, to end life on all planets and literally every other Earth was destroyed and you were stranded at the vanishing point, you know. And it ate Jenny Onats. Jenny Onats was the granddaughter of Barry Allen, and a speedster like him. She was a member of the Legion of Superheroes under the name XS. Despite her ancestry though, Jenny did not at first display any signs of super speed. However, the Dominators, knowing her family heritage, captured her. And at the sight of seeing her father tortured, her latent super speed powers did activate. She managed to escape with her father before stray fire from the Dominators caused their base to explode, and during the Legion's first trip to the 20th century, XS was separated from them. She ended up meeting her cousin Impulse and became good friends with him. She ended up revealing how she was participating in an archaeological dig in the future, and XS fought side by side with Impulse and other speedsters during the events of Dead Heat. Afterwards, the 27th century Flash fixed her grandfather's cause treadmill, enabling her to go home. Unfortunately, she overshot, encountering two further incarnations of the Legion before getting back to her time. Impulse, though, left her a goodbye note in the building that she was participating in excavating, so that's sweet. And at 7, Malcolm Thawne. Malcolm Thawne is the lost twin brother of Barry Allen. He is Cobalt Blue, one of a number of evil counterparts of the Flash that wields the blue flame. On the stormy night of May 13th, two pregnant women came to the office of Fallville, Iowa's Dr. Gilmore. However, the doctor had been drinking that night, and he had sent his nurse home. The child of one of the women, Charlie and Thon, had been strangled by its own umbilical cord, and Gilmore was too intoxicated to save the baby. However, luckily for Gilmore, lightning caused a blackout in the hospital. Gilmore quickly enters the room where another woman, Nora Allen, gave birth, and Gilmore, to cover up the death of Charlene's baby, in the darkness quickly removes the first baby, and then closes the baby's mouth so that it doesn't cry, and then he gives that twin to the Thon family, telling the Allen family that one of their children didn't make it. Yeah. The twin that remained with the Allens was called Barry and grew up to be the Flash. And the other twin, however, was raised by the Thons and was named Malcolm. This is also the distant, like, great, great times 20 grandfather of Eobard Thon. Yeah, the reverse Flash. So, Eobard and Barry actually share the same blood. Which is freaking nuts. Damn, I did not know that. Although, I probably should have. And at six, Jay West. Jay West and his twin sister Iris were born to the third Flash Wally West and his wife Linda Park. Although the twins were initially miscarried as the result of an attack by Zoom, Linda's pregnancy was miraculously restored during a later battle, somehow. When Wally went into the Speed Force during a battle with Superboy Prime, he brought Linda and the infant twins with him and spent some time in an Earth like world inhabited by an alternate version of Jay Garrick, and they traveled to another planet occupied by technology advanced aliens who had dealings with a Flash in the past. Yep, this is actually true. When they were first born, Jay and his sister exhibited no signs of having inherited their father's powers. However, after turning three months old, their metabolisms sped up and they began to age rapidly and exhibited powers. Their alien hosts, I mean like, not like they were hosted, like the aliens that were living with 
the Wests, I guess I, could, I should say. Taught Linda the basics of operating machinery that would stabilize the twins' powers, and I guess kind of halt their accelerated aging. Jay once overheard his father explain this to a Justice League teammate though, and uh, he mentioned the possibility that the twins could in age so much that they died. Deeply frightened by this, he kept this information to himself, but later on did reveal it to his sister, who she revealed that she already kind of guessed that. I mean, like, it's kind of obvious. Halfway through into number five, Nora West Allen. In a previous timeline, Nora went back to the past to finally meet her father and became part of Team Flash, working alongside her parents and her friends. However, unbeknownst to the team at the time, Nora was working with Eobard Thawne, who was imprisoned in 2049, on a secret agenda to destroy Cicada's dagger and so that he would be saved from execution, whereas Nora was trying to save Barry from vanishing in a future crisis. After Team Flash defeated Cicada by administering the metahuman cure to her younger self and destroying her uncle's dagger, Nora was then erased from existence once a new timeline started to set in. However, in the current post-crisis timeline created by Oliver Queen and the Paragons, Nora is a vigilante operating in 2049 who fights metahuman criminals such as Godspeed alongside her younger brother Bart. During one fight with Godspeed though, he went to the Flash Museum and used the cosmic treadmill to travel back in time. Fearing that they would never be able to find him if he got away, Nora and Bart broke their family's number one rule and decided to follow him eventually ending up in the present. Well, I guess our present, not their present. Saying present is kind of a broad term. However, Nora, I guess this post-crisis Nora, grew up with stories of her other timeline self, of like her parents were telling her about her other version, which is pretty messed up if you ask me. Like your parents going on and on about another version of literally you that you desperately have to try to live up to. Yeah, that's that's messed up. This is in the, in, in the Arrowverse, by the way. And for inertia, the bitter feud between the Allen family and the Thon family would span generations, although despite them actually kind of sharing blood. Even in the 30th century, President Thawne sought to recruit Bart Allen in his revenge campaign against the Allens, since Bart was half Thawne himself. When that failed, Thawne mixed Bart's DNA with Thawne genetic material to create a speedster clone who he named Thaddeus Thawne. Or I guess Thaddeus Thawne. Either way. Come on, really? Alliteration? Whereas Bart grew up in a hyper-accelerated world, Thaddeus' childhood was the exact opposite of this. Cause you know, reverse flash. His development was super slow, which led to the young speedster to become more calculating and methodical. You know, the exact traits a sociopath has. Thaddeus was also taught to hate the Allen family, and Impulse in particular. In addition to this modification, Thaddeus' growth and development was slowed down. This is in contrast to Bart's accelerated development. However, after killing Bart, Wally West had other plans for him. Upon hearing of Bart's death, an enraged Flash, this Flash being Wally West, hunted Inertia down. Though he thought of killing him, Flash decided instead to do something worse. He used his abilities to slow Inertia's movements down to the point where he was totally immobile, essentially a living statue, and then he placed Inertia on display in the Flash Museum, facing statues of Bart Allen as Impulse and Kid Flash. Though he could still think, see, and hear in normal time, Inertia was doomed to spend eternity in a state of near total paralysis, staring at images of Bart, plus being gawked at by everyone coming to the Flash Museum. Oh, that's so brutal. Getting close to the end in at number three, Bart Allen. Bart Allen was the product of the union between two families that had been bitter rivals for centuries. His father, Don Allen, was the son of Barry Allen, the second Flash, and his mother was Maloney Thawne, daughter of the Earth government president and descendant of Flash villains Cobalt Blue and Professor Zoom. Bart was born with his grandfather's speed, and he had an incredibly high metabolism that also caused him to age at hyperspeed. When he was chronologically two years old, physically, he looked like he was 12. After Wally helped him solve his aging problem, Bart helped Wally defeat Cobra. Bart Bart then moved to Manchester, Alabama with Max Mercury. Max had also used his connections to supply Bart with a birth certificate, stuff like that, passport, you know the deal. And Bart began the ninth grade at Manchester Junior High, when he was probably like, supposed to be like, four. <laughs> He managed to make quite a few friends, chief among them being Carol Buckland. Max continued to train him in the art of super speed, having him run off courses while dodging axes and knives and solving jigsaw puzzles in midair. You know, 
Stuff like that, I guess. Ultimately enlisting his aid to battle his old foe Savitar. During this time, Bart served a brief stint in the New Titans before becoming one of the founding members of Young Justice, before getting killed. But ultimately, in a number two, the Tornado Twins. The Tornado Twins, Don and Don Allen, are the children of Iris West and Barry Allen. In one of the possible futures, instead of being heroes though, they turn into supervillains and terrorize the future Central City. According to Professor Zoom, one of the reasons for this change was because of Barry's absence in their lives, which made them misguided and hated their own father, which is weird because in the Flash show, Nora was like obsessed with her dad, but you know, whatever. Don, D-O-N, is the father of Bart Allen, and Don, D-A-W-N, is the mother of Jenny Ognatz. The duo though ended when Don was killed by a dominator in the Flash number 769, nice, in June of 2021. These are pretty damn powerful characters, and they're at number two because you kinda have to count them together, so yeah, two people is definitely gonna be more powerful than one. But this is actually, interestingly enough, supposed to be the twins that Barry had in the original Arrowverse timeline. However, seemingly after Flashpoint, it went to it went from Dawn to Nora. And then, and then, like, and then it went from Nora to Nora and Bart. This seems to be hinted at since during the 100th episode of The Flash that takes place in season five, a 2015 Thon disguised as Harrison Wells assumes that Nora's name is Dawn before being corrected by Barry. And finally, in a number one, The Forces. Okay, this is certainly going off book here, but the most recent season of The Flash introduced three additional forces into the Arrowverse. While recreating the Speed Force with the power of love and positive thinking, Barry and Iris ended up creating three new forces along with it. For the first half of the season, these are kind of the big bads of the show. However, for some reason, since they were created along with the new Speed Force, they refer to these forces, including the Speed Force itself, which materializes as Nora Allen, Barry's mother, as their kids. Which is weird enough, given that technically Barry has now given birth to his mother in a sense, but by that definition, the forces are also literally the most powerful children of the Flash. They're literal forces of nature. They refer to themselves as a family. The Sage Force calls the strength forth his, his sister and Barry and Iris mom and dad. And technically, without Barry and Iris, they wouldn't have been born. However, since I'm referring to the Arrowverse versions of these forces, plenty of diehard comic fans are going to be mad at me, but that's fine. Barry literally gave birth to the Speed Force, and that's enough for me to claim that they're his most powerful children. Deal with it. Number 10, Crusader. Crusader is the daughter of X-Men team member Rogue and Avenger Captain America. I know. A weird combination. But in the reality of Earth 9811, these two ended up together after the heroes and villains on Battleworld decided to call a truce. Remaining there, they settled down and raised families, putting their differences aside. I'm not sure how their relationship worked with Rogue not really being able to touch people in all of this point, or how she had a child considering that. But perhaps, like on Earth 616, she eventually was able to work through the trauma causing this side effect of her powers. Or perhaps the Captain America of Earth 9811 was immune to her involved voluntary energy and power draining effects. Either way, Sarah is their daughter. She gets much of her power from her mother, or rather she gets much of her power from the power her mother had absorbed in her day, meaning that Sarah is super strong, durable, and can fly. She is also considered worthy enough to lift Thor's hammer and wields her father's shield. Number 9, Wolverine. I really wanted to put Laura Kinney higher up on this list because, well, I love her so much, but unfortunately the psionics are just always pushing some of my favorite and most powerful characters further down on these lists. Those psionics. Oh well. Laura Kinney as X-23 and now Wolverine is still one of the most powerful children of the X-Men around. Some argue that she is more clone, while others argue that she is more biological offspring of Logan, but in reality, she's kind of a bit of both. She was created as a female clone of Wolverine after his genetic material was combined with that of her creator, scientist Sarah Kinney. Sarah noticed that there were damaged spots basically in the samples of Logan's genetic material that they had, which was why their cloning process had been unsuccessful up to this point. And so she used her own genetic material to patch those rough spots, which made Laura a female clone. Sarah was forced to carry Laura to term as a surrogate by her jealous colleague Xander Rice, as punishment for even creating the female clone to begin with, a strategy that admittedly had not been approved. Laura has power similar to her father. She has a regenerative healing factor and was also trained from birth to be a skilled fighter, bodyguard, and assassin. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to learn about more children of the X-Men, there are a 
lot out there in the multiverse. Be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8 Chimera Chimera is the daughter of Storm and likely Black Panther who hails from the alternate reality of 13729. Yeah, sadly Storm and T'Challa have never had a child together in the main continuity. I know, it's a bit of a bummer. Unless they had like a real secret child that we just don't know about yet, but I doubt it. Chimera seems to have inherited the powers of her mother but also shares a connection to the Earth which allows her to draw on and harness its energy. She is also a skilled tracker and can communicate telepathically with animals. I'd also assume as she's the daughter of Storm that she's a skilled combatant as well. As while Storm is more well known for her goddess status and weather manipulation powers, she is also an extremely skilled fighter. And if she's Black Panther's daughter then she should definitely be a skilled fighter. I mean you got two amazing parents that are both amazing fighters. So. Just saying. Number seven, Charles Xavier II. Charles Xavier II is the son of Charles Xavier and Mystique, if you can believe that. I know, it's pretty shocking. Charles Xavier number two was technically born into the reality of Earth 616, where we later find out that while Mystique actually took the form of Moira when giving birth, Charles actually knew that he was in a relationship with Raven, so it wasn't like a trick of hers. They were actually just wanted to be together, I guess. This version of Charles, however, is an all grown up one from the alternate future of Earth 13729. When his powers first manifested, he accidentally killed his adoptive mother and ended up later joining forces with his half brother, Raze, another child of Mystique's. Sired by Wolverine, another child of the X Men. Charles Xavier II has a brilliant and conniving mind, and like his father, is an immensely gifted telepath, capable of using his powers to bend others to his will. Number six, Polaris. Polaris is the daughter of Magneto, and while you might not think of Magneto as being an X Men, considering, you know, he started out as an X Men villain, he has also worked with the team before and even served as a member himself. Heck, at one point, he was in charge of the whole New Mutants crew. Let's not forget that. Magneto may have some questionable methods when it comes to getting justice that put him on the spectrum of villain, but I think at the end of the day he's just trying to do what's best for mutants. Or at least what he thinks is best for mutant kind. Polaris, like her father, also has magnetic based powers which, like her father, are also pretty impressive. Polaris is considered an alpha level mutant and recently got to join the X-Men team herself after being elected to join them in the Krakoan X-Men elections. Psychic elections. Imagine if we could all just vote psychically. That would be awesome. That would be so much easier. You would just like sit down and you'd be like, who do I want to vote for? Mmm, done. Number 5, Cable. Cable is the son of Scott Summers, aka Cyclops, non ex member Madeline Pryor, who later becomes the villain known as the Goblin Queen, and another ex man's Jean Grey, who kind of becomes like an adoptive mother, but who also possesses Madeline's memories of raising baby Christopher. Because comics. Cable is Nathan Christopher Charles Summers, often referred to as just Nathan Summers, or really just Cable. Although back in the day, we did know him as Baby Christopher. Cable, as a baby, was kidnapped by Apocalypse and infected with the techno organic virus. This is the only thing that makes him weak ish, but really he is still amazingly strong as he can even fend off that virus, containing it to one side of his body using his psionic powers. That in and of itself is pretty impressive as the techno organic virus is generally known for being, well, unstoppable. Even with his psionic powers mainly preoccupied, Cable is still a hard one to beat as he has so many combatant based skills that he brings to the table and he is also an experienced time traveler besides. Number 4, Rachel Summers. Yes, get ready because many of the most powerful ex kids out there just happen to be Summers related. So, yeah, get ready for that. Honestly, I've always wanted to do a video just to explain the complicated nature that is the Summers and Gray family tree, which honestly is a lot and it's very timey wimey. Rachel herself is one of those very complex kids of theirs. She is the daughter of Jean Gray and Scott Summers from the alternate Earth of 811. In that reality, she was made into a hound, a weapon used to hunt down mutants, even being one herself. Rachel is an extremely powerful telepath and telekinetic who also has the ability to chrono skim and manipulate time, even traveling through it. Rachel is also known for being an avatar of the phoenix, at one time actually considered the true avatar for it, but then later having the power sort of dialed down to a mere echo of it. So she was no longer the true avatar, they were just like, you just have a thing, it's not even like the real phoenix force, but it's like a version of it. Still, the seeming peace or echo of the phoenix force that resides within her has been known to flare up from time to time, or her connection to the phoenix force, however we want to see that. Occasionally boosting Rachel to an off 
the charts level of power. But like I said, that doesn't happen all the time. Number 3. Hope Summers Hope is the adopted daughter of Cable, who was originally known as the mutant Messiah baby. Cable saved Hope from Bishop, who basically wanted to destroy her. In Bishop's reality, the mutant Messiah would end up causing the event that led to the oppression and persecution of mutants. However, in Cable's reality, the mutant Messiah would grow up to become a savior. So you can see why these two were opposed on this topic. For the X-Men of Earth 616, the mutant Messiah was the first new mutant to have been born since basically M-Day. And so she brought hope to the mutants of the 616 reality. Cable body slided with hope to another time to raise her in safety. He would end up naming hope after her adoptive mother, his love who died, Hope. And she got the Summers name from Cable himself. But although she looks a lot like Jean, she actually has no biological relation to the Summers or the Grey families. At least not that we know of. Hope's mutant abilities allow her to copy the powers of anyone within a certain range. Hope also gains access to these powers without struggling at all to use them. Receiving them basically at their peak level and with the, the auto knowledge basically of how to use them. So if you're like, oh she's gotta like figure it out. No, she's just like instant god mode with those powers basically. Number 2. Scarlet Witch Wanda is known for being one of the most powerful beings in the Marvel Universe. She has used her powers to completely warp reality the world over and her chaos magic has pulled off other immensely world changing feats such as flipping the alignment of all major heroes and villains in the comics during the events of Axis. Initially her chaos magic powers were believed to be somewhat mutant in origin. In fact they were kind of presented initially as like jinx like mystical mutant abilities during her first appearances. However we've since learned that both Wanda and her superpower brother Pietro, aka Quicksilver, were never really mutants at all, nor were they related to Magneto. However, they still spent a good amount of their life around Magneto, who secretly believed them to be his children, and then another good amount of time thinking that he was their actual father, until it was revealed that this was all due to manipulation by the High Evolutionary. High Evolutionary just coming in and messing pretty much everybody up when it comes to their backstories and origins. Wanda herself has never really gotten along with the X-Men, especially since the events of M-Day, but she is still considered a think, a part of Magneto's family, and a powerful one at that, regardless of her status as a mutant or a non-mutant. I know there are some people out there that want to be like, it never happened, but like, they still spent a lot of time together thinking that they were family, so I think we can still count it, friends. Also, make Wanda a mutant again. Do it. Make it happen. Give me Wanda and Quicksilver back. Number 1. X-Man X-Man is Nathaniel Grey, the lab-born child made by combining the genetic materials of both Jean Grey and Cyclops. So basically, like, Cable, but if he had been made perfectly by villain Mr. Sinister. He actually hails from the alternate reality of AOA, Age of Apocalypse, Earth 295. Here, Sinister created him to use as his own weapon, but of course, Nate being so powerful, managed to escape Sinister and instead ended up being raised by Forge of Earth 295. He is considered one of the most powerful mutants of all time, which would also make him one of the most powerful children of the X Men out there. Nate can warp reality, resurrect the dead, resurrect himself, travel to alternate Earths and dimensions, and even manipulate the time. Straight. He's basically the most OP of characters when it comes to the Marvel Universe. And if you've seen artwork of him, you will probably recognize him as someone who looks like Mutant Jesus. Which, yes, he is god level, so that is the point. Number 10. Kristoff and Kadira Von Doom Kristoff and Kadira Von Doom are the children of Storm and Doctor Doom. They come from the novel series X-Men The Chaos Engine, which is actually a trilogy, wherein we explore what would happen if three great villains took control of the Marvel Universe. creating their own version of a perfect world using the cosmic cube. It starts off with Doom's variation on this world. In this reality, Dr. Doom has made Storm his wife and she rules by his side as his empress. The union of these powerful characters produces two children, Kristoff and Kadira. We can assume of course being the children of both Doom and Storm that they would be physically, mentally and demonstrably powerful when it came to their abilities, especially being raised by these two powerhouses. Also if I wasn't clear about this, this is an alternate reality so if you're like when did this happen? happen. It is not main continuity. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more children of the X-Men, they have a lot of kids if we you know, surf through the multiverse, so we could do it for you. If you want that part three, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number nine, Nocturne. Nocturne is the daughter of Nightcrawler and Scarlet Witch. Obviously, not from the main continuity. In fact, Talia Wagner is known for being a part of a multiversal hero team, the Exiles. Nocturne is from the alternate reality of Earth 2182. In fact, back on her home reality, which first appeared in Millennial Visions, Talia is also known as a member of the X-Men team, fighting alongside her 
father, Nightcrawler, who is actually their field leader. She is a low level telepath with incredible superhuman agility skills, the ability to wall crawl, and the ability to fire powerful brimstone hex energy bolts, something inherited from both her father and her mother. Nocturne's physical appearance is also similar to her father's, a bit demonic looking, and of course, blue. All my blue X Men. <laughs> Top 10 blue X Men. Actually, I feel like there's a lot of X Men that are that are blue or mutants that are blue maybe there's a lot of blue mutants for sure i don't know about x-men team members number eight jimmy hudson jimmy hudson is the son of wolverine from the ultimate reality of earth 1610 his powers are similar to his father's but in this reality they're believed to work a little bit differently as opposed to just being insane healing powers jimmy's power set in this universe as a mutant is believed to be based more in survival so these powers aren't necessarily just about healing but survival instincts and capability meaning that jimmy is just much better at surviving and evolving to survive than anyone else alive on the planet. And I mean that because in this reality, Wolverine eventually dies. So really, Jimmy is the only one left alive who's really good at surviving. Jimmy Hudson has also been bonded to a poison before and gained control of his poison, which are basically alien-like beings resembling symbiotes in look and abilities, but ultimately a different alien race themselves called poisons. So yeah. Jimmy is the son of Wolverine and Magneto's wife, Meg Delencher, although Wolverine urges him through a letter when the truth of his connection to Jimmy is revealed that he actually shouldn't focus too much on, you know, who his biological parents are. Jimmy was raised by adoptive parents. His dad actually served with Logan in the war and agreed to look after Jimmy in his father's place, even giving the young boy his own family name. Hudson. Number seven, Esme. Esme is one of the main Stepford cuckoos. Well, I mean, I guess they're all pretty main, but you know what I mean. She's probably one of the most well known if we're talking offhand about how many of the cuckoos you can name. Esme and the other cuckoos are basically like the children of Emma Frost. Although, as I've said before, not children that she had consensually. And I didn't say that before in this list, but if you've heard me talk about the Stepford cuckoos and their relation to Emma, yeah. Instead, these were lab babies basically made from Emma's eggs that were stolen from Emma while she was in a comatose state. Esme, like the other cuckoos, is kind of like a genetic clone as well as a child of Emma's, and Emma actually does consider the cuckoos to be like her daughters. She treats them as though they were her own flesh and blood, and often her own responsibility, kinda stepping in to like play mom sometimes, although she does give them freedom to make their own mistakes. I guess what I mean is, Emma isn't known for being like a controlling kind of parent. She's like, I'm here when you need me, otherwise you do you. More recently in the comics, Esme, known for her diamond form and power powerful telepathic abilities, teamed up and primarily dated Young Cable. Well, technically all the cuckoos were dating him at one point, though I would say Esme was basically the main, main squeeze of Young Cable and the sister that he was most taken by while he was dating all of them. And if you're like, whoa, how did that happen? The Stepford cuckoos, they share things because they're kind of like a hive mind. So they're like, we'll just all date this person. Is cool. Also, Krakoa. Everyone's dating everyone. <laughs> Number six, Akahiro. Akahiro is the son of Wolverine and his wife, Itsu. Unfortunately, before Akahiro was even born, his life took a turn for the worse. Along with inheriting his father's powers, I think he also inherited some of his tragic, tragic luck. Wolverine has the worst luck, I think. His mother, Itsu, was killed before she could give birth to him, assassinated. The child was believed dead, but in reality, he had been cut from her womb and possibly due to his inherited healing powers, miraculously survived. Although, that's not clear. Because usually your powers don't manifest until puberty, but sometimes your powers manifest when you're in the womb. I mean, look at Professor X with Cassandra Nova. Apparently that's a thing that happened. Akihiro would grow up and become a pawn of the villain known as Romulus. For most of his life, he'd also be known as Dokken, a cruel nickname given to him when he was a child, being raised by his adoptive parents. The nickname was given to him because of his mixed race appearance, being part American and part Japanese. Though to be clear, his parents weren't the ones that gave it to him. It was people around his parents. Akahiro's powers are similar to Wolverine's, though his bone claws are a little bit different in terms of placement and appearance. Like his father, Akahiro is also known for being a skilled fighter as well. The apple does not fall far from the tree when it comes to fighting abilities. Number five, Xandra Naramani. Xandra is Professor X's daughter, who is created out of his genetic material and that of his lover's genetic material, the Shi'ar Magistrix Lalandra Naramani, after both of them were believed dead. As such, Xandra grew up to become Shi'ar royalty and also 
also spent a good amount of her life hunted because of this, with various parties attempting to use her for their own means. Xandra is an extremely gifted telepath. She can manipulate others' minds, read minds, and can create hyper realistic telepathic illusions. Number four, Ruby Summers. She was the ex offspring used in our oh so clickable thumb for the part one to this list, and although she was on my extended list for that part one, my like long brainstorm that I came up with, I didn't get around to talking about her because I kind of reached a point where there were too many Summers children on that list, and I was like, I don't want to make this a top 10 children of Cyclops. We got that list, and also, that's not what this list is. What can I say? Sykes got strong genes. That's why Mr. Sinister is so obsessed after all, and is known as the number one fan of the Summers Club. Scott Summers is Ruby's dad in the alternate reality she hails from, and Emma Frost is her mother. This makes Ruby fairly powerful, not at the level of Hope or X-Man, but still pretty impressive. She's also super cool looking, which is an added bonus. Ruby hails from the alternate Earth of 1191, the home reality of famous X-Men ally Bishop. Ruby is also capable of emitting optic blasts like her dad and his brothers, but she has more control over when and how she emits these blasts, unlike her dad who's like, I literally need a visor. Ruby also comes with her Ruby form, which like her mother's diamond form, grants her invulnerability and pretty much immortality. Number three, Olivier Raven. Olivier Raven is legally known as Olivier LeBeau and is one of the alternate reality children of Gambit and Rogue. Honestly, I feel like there are not enough of these kids out in the multiverse. I don't know if that's just me. For a couple as famous as Gambit and Rogue, I mean, you just, you would think that we'd have a lot more kids from them, at least through the multiverse. Though admittedly, I'm not quite sure that Rogue and Gambit are really the kid having type, that, at least from what I've seen in the main continuity. They seem pretty content with just having their fur babies right now. So maybe they just aren't super into having kids as a family. Olivier hails from the reality of Earth 41001, the reality of Gen Next, a group Ollie is part of. He has powers similar to his mother's, except he has better control over them and is able to choose when and how much power, life energy, and memories he absorbs via physical contact, or doesn't absorb in cases where he just, you know, wants to make physical contact without using his powers. He can also absorb powers on a more permanent level, although he has less control, it seems, over when this happens. Happens. Like his father, he also seems to have some charm based powers. Either that, or he's just charming. Number two, Proteus. Proteus is the son of Moira McTaggart, who before I would count more as like an ex ally, but with recent revelations, we can definitely consider her a member in the same way we might consider someone like Charles Xavier. It turns out that Moira herself was a mutant this whole time, possessing unique reincarnation powers. She has also been known for being a leader and teacher of X Men groups before, including the time when she led a team that. That Professor X then recruited, sending them into Krakoa to rescue the original X Men. Not Krakoa as we know it now, but Krakoa as it was back in the day when it was like a monster island. Proteus is Kevin McTaggart, son of Joseph and Moira McTaggart. He is currently one of the five on Krakoa, and his powers as part of that team are mainly used to warp reality, allowing the non viable eggs that Egg, formerly known as Gold Balls, produces to become viable for life. These eggs are then used to grow new versions of fallen. And mutants. Proteus is an Omega level mutant who requires hosts to survive. Initially, Kevin had a body, but now he's basically just pure energy. The hosts he controls and feeds off of eventually are exhausted and killed by that energy drain, making him not just a powerful psionic mutant, but also a powerful energy vampire as well, unintentionally. Number one, Legion. Legion is the son of Professor Charles Xavier that was conceived when he had a love affair with Gabrielle Holler, which is where Legion gets his legal last name, as his given name is David Holler. Legion is so powerful because he suffers from a severe disassociative identity disorder, where he has more than one hundred personas residing within him. Each persona has a number, many of names, and they each have their own specific power set that show up whenever they take over. Because of this, there is almost nothing that Legion isn't capable of. He can manipulate matter and time. We've seen him time travel and completely warp reality as a result of his possible abilities. He also has some pretty powerful hair, which I gotta say, I'm happy that he still rocks even now in the current modern day comics. He's still got that sweet hair. So tall. Number 10, Van L. Van El is the imaginary son of Superman that he is made to believe he had in the Superman annual from 1985, annual number 11, from the original Superman series. Superman ends up being put in a trance by a plant that starts to 
kind of attack him as part of a villainous plot. While he's in this trance, he sees what life would be like if he had remained on Krypton and grew up there. He ends up married and with a son named Van El and a daughter. We don't see Van El's abilities when it comes to powers, but he is a Kryptonian with both his mom and his dad being from that planet, which means that on Earth, he would probably be at least at Superman levels. Unfortunately, he is just a dream, and Superman heartbreakingly realizes that this world is false and he must wake up. It's actually a pretty sad issue, to be real. The story is like tragic. Number nine, Cyril. Cyril isn't a real child of Superman, although at first we actually thought she was one. Cyril appeared to be the daughter of Lois Lane and Supes from a distant future. She even looked a lot like both of her parents and demonstrated similar powers, but in the end we learned that she was simply created as part of a plot to deliver the Yes virus, which would help Brainiac take over the world. She was created by combining Kryptonian DNA with a human, grafting the DNA sort of over top of her human self. Originally, she was a human known as Mia, and when she learned of her true origin, she destroyed herself in order to save the world. Cyril was also implanted with all the memories of her parents and being raised by them, so to her, her life as their daughter had felt very real. Despite the fact that we learned she was really a fake. Fake daughters, I feel like, should still count, especially if they have memories memories of being raised. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you are loving my super comfy sweater, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. And if you don't like my comfy sweater, don't tell me, because I don't want to know. It's really comfy, okay guys? I got it for $5 at Value Village, don't judge me. Number 8, Superwoman. Superwoman is Kara Kent, the daughter of Superman and Lois Lane from the alternate reality of Earth 3839. This is the reality we explore in John Byrne's series Superman and Batman Generations. Here Kara is seen as having the same level of power as Superman, at least initially. Eventually we learn though that Kara really only possesses half the strength of her dad's powers. Oh dear. This means that although she has worked alongside her dad as his sidekick under the name Supergirl for years, she is no match when her evil brother shows up to destroy her and her wedding. Kara was becoming a hero all her own, taking up the mantle of Superwoman and joining forces with her partner in crime fighting and her partner in romance, Bruce Wayne Jr., Batman's son. The two were married, but Kara's brother manipulated by Lex Luthor to believe that both his father and Kara had actually taken away the powers that he should have been born with, shows up to the wedding and kills Kara shortly thereafter. Number 7, Supergirl. This is the imaginary daughter of Superman, but she still likely exists in some alternate reality because technically every imagining is like an alternate reality, if that makes sense. So she exists probably somewhere out in the multiverse other than just Superman's dream. And so I'm gonna count her. Also, the dream featuring her in retrospect to the rest of the universe is like really tragic. So I feel like for that reason alone, we should just talk about it because it's a pretty cool moment in injustice because tragic things are cool when they are safely contained in fictional worlds and can make you feel emotions without actually having to deal with the consequences of the tragedies that the emotions come from. Supergirl is Lara Lane Kent, the daughter Lois and Clark would have had in the event that Joker and Harley hadn't made Superman believe Lois was doomsday and made him kill her. In this very different world, Superman and his daughter, Supergirl, are both still heroes. Her powers are very similar to her father's, and while she isn't quite as experienced as he is, she is still on a similar level when it comes to what she's capable of. Number 6, Carol and Jane Kent. Carol and Jane Kent are the daughters of Superman and Lois from the comic series Superman Secret Identity. We learn of their powers in the final issue, issue number 4, which acts as the conclusion to our tale as Clark moves into his twilight years and his kids mostly take over. Initially, he and Lois weren't sure if they had any powers at all, but many years later they find out that their kids' powers did manifest. It happened to Carol and Jane, their twin daughters, in their teenage years. As adults, they are initially a little less experienced than Clark, but eventually go on to replace him as he leaves more and more of the heroics up to them. By the end of the series, I'd say power level wise, they are about at the same place as their dad or perhaps even a little bit stronger than he was in his prime. Also, Superman's secret identity is just a really well written story, so if you haven't checked out this miniseries, I highly recommend you go and give it a gander. Also, I can't believe it's from the early 2000s, like to me, it feels much more like modern day like now, not like early 2000s. 
I mean that as a compliment. Number five, Supergirl. Seriously, get ready for a list full of Supergirls, because unsurprisingly, a lot of Superman's kids take up that mantle. This Supergirl is Lara Kent from Frank Miller's Dark Knight Alternate Earth, aka Earth 31. Here, Lara is the daughter of Superman and Wonder Woman. She stands out due to her very, very blue hair. Being a hybrid baby, she ends up inheriting both her parents' powers, making her super powerful and an immensely skilled fighter, having been trained by her mother in the way of the Amazons. One thing that makes her unique as well in comparison to some of the other super kids out there is that she believes her powers make her better than non-powered people. And she actually strives to one day rule over the non-powered people of Earth. A little bit, a little bit villainous there, Lara. I mean, she's not gonna do it because she's like, I know my dad's like, these people, we gotta protect them but she's definitely thinking about it. <laughs> Number four, Superman. Jonathan Kent is the natural born son of Lois Lane and Clark Kent, AKA Cal L, Superman, from the main continuity. He was born during the events that caused a reset of the universe when the New 52 basically came about. He and his family were relocated to the New 52 Prime Earth, even though they were originally from New Earth, meaning that for a while we had two Supermans on planet Earth, although one was operating in secret, that one being John's dad. John would become good friends with another super son, Damian Wayne, Batman's semi-natural born son. Well, not really. His whole his whole existence is also an interesting story, but enough of that. He's definitely Batman's biological son at least, so we can count that. Damien and John initially didn't get along, but would find common ground and then become the best of friends. Of course, then John went to space and grew up rapidly, and currently in the comics, he has also taken up the mantle of Superman after his father, now that he's back on Earth. John's powers are at a very similar scope and level, but as a human Kryptonian hybrid, he apparently does have the potential to become even more powerful than Clark. Hybrid babies are the best babies in terms of superpowers. Number three, the golden child. This version of John Kent comes to us from the alternate Earth of Earth 31. Yep, we're going back to the Dark Knight universe of Frank Miller. In one of his latest Dark Knight universe stories, it was revealed that baby John, who is now a young child here, also born of Superman and Wonder Woman, is actually something completely new when it comes to his power levels. Also, he doesn't have blue hair. No blue hair for John. His sister, Lara, even suggests that while she agrees with her father about teaching John, that they should soon be prepared to actually learn from him because he's that powerful. At the end of Dark Knight Returns the Golden Child, we see the true extent of John's powers when he takes on Darkseid, calling him basically an old fart the entire time as he defeats him pretty easily. Darkseid attempts to use his Omega Beams only to have young John swallow that power, absorbing it, and then firing it back with his Neutron Vision powers. Totally unique powers. John is also able to protect his sister Lara in the fight, making her intangible somehow before both her and he fade away. Seemingly transforming both of them into some type of energy? I, I think that's what happened. Ah, uh, that's kind of a weird comic, but yes, it did happen. Number two, Hyperman. Hyperman is the son of Superman and Wonder Woman who comes from the reality belonging to the Kingdom Come story and follow-up story, The Kingdom. In that story, little baby John Kent is kidnapped by Gog. He ends up being rescued by two different versions of his parents and his godfather, Batman, but ends up with himself in the end, his future self. The hero, Hyperman, who also rules and guards over all of hyper time. Hyperman raises is the child himself, so raises himself himself. Continuing the circle and pretty much guaranteeing that John Kent will grow up to become Hyperman, a time traveling, dimension hopping hero, because I assume that's how Hyperman was raised by himself. And then when that one becomes older, he'll have to raise another one. I feel like this is a time loop and it will never end. Number one, Supergirl. This version of Supergirl is Ariella Kent, the daughter of Linda Danvers' Supergirl and Superman of Earth One. Yeah, it might sound weird to think that Supergirl and Superman got it on and ended up having a kid together, but remember, this is Linda Danvers' Supergirl. No relation to Supes, and it's also a Superman from another alternate reality because it's Earth One Superman, who was therefore even further removed to any kind of relation or affiliation with Linda. Ariella Kent and ended up kind of being time or reality displaced due to continuities needing to be altered and set right, but she is still probably out there somewhere in the cosmos, somewhere in the multiverse, although we haven't seen her in the comics for a long time. Ariella was known for her massive power levels, which as a child she had a hard time actually fully comprehending, meaning that wherever she went she generally caused a lot of destruction. 
accidentally. This is what happens when you let a super powerful child fly around space and travel through time without any parental supervision. Ariella was also a hybrid baby being born part matrix aka lab made semi alien goo. It's basically what the matrix is and part Kryptonian. There's gonna be people that are gonna be like that's not what the matrix is. And like no 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 DC matrix. Look it up. It's a, was a weird it was a weird thing but it happened. Oh, 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 oh,